Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Porous Media Tea Time Talk. It's our 25th session today. So we are part of the Interpor Young Academy, and uh, we give an opportunity to young researchers to broadcast their results to a, to a broad community. So I'm joined here today by my friends uh, Mohamed Nurepu from the University of Oslo in Norway, Nara Brandão from the Federal University of Uberlândia in Brazil, and Javier Santos from the University of Texas in the United States. So before we start, I'd like to uh, call your attention to a short course from also from the uh, Interpor Academy that uh, has registration now open. So it's this one here, uh, transport of viruses and colloids in variably saturated porous media. So certainly a very, very important topic these days. And uh, you can register for that one at the website. So it's uh, you just go to interpor.org slash short courses and you can register there. So it starts on October 11th. So that is already next uh, Monday, right? Yes. And then and so we are joined today. Our first speaker is uh, Leila Hashimi, and uh, she obtained her master's in uh, reservoir engineering with a focus on poor network modeling. Since 2020, she has been working as a research assistant and then a PhD student at TU Delft on hydrogen energy storage. Today, she will talk about modeling and experimental study of hydrogen transport at micro scale in porous media. So Leila, the floor is yours. And I'd like to just uh, re re remind the, the audience that you can type in questions anytime on, the, on YouTube, in the, in, the, in the comments on the right side, and we'll read the questions to the speakers at the end of the talk. Okay, so Leila, please go ahead. Thank you. It's uh, my true pleasure and honor to be here. Thanks for the invitation and nice introduction. Today, I'm going to present you our recent papers on both modeling and experimental study of hydrogen transport at micro scale in porous media. I am presenting this work today, but of course, uh, I'm not the only one who contributed for this work. So I would like to acknowledge my co-authors and uh, my supervisor and uh, other colleagues here at TU Delft and Professor Martin Blunt from Imperial College of London for, this great, for their great contribution to this work. First, we will have an introduction on the energy transition and importance of underground hydrogen storage, followed by an overview on existing literature studies and their limitations. Then I will move on to poor network modeling and how we did sensitivity analysis to quantify the uncertainty. And finally, I will show you our experimental results for measuring a static uh, contact angle of hydrogen, brine, and rock. I believe, if not say all of you, but most of you agree the importance of transition to renewable energy sources in order to reduce CO2 emission into atmosphere. But there is a challenge here, you know, because uh, mm, renewable energy sources are naturally intermittent. So uh, to have a sustainable energy supply, man, we need to store uh, renewable energy when the hydrogen, uh, when the production is higher than the uh, demand. So how we can store the renewable energies? One of the promising approach is converting them to hydrogen, where we can store hydrogen and because uh, it has a very high capacity of energy, if it has a very high energy capacity. But on the other hand, uh, there is a limitation because hydrogen and has a very low density. So we need a giant volumetric capacity to store hydrogen. This is beyond the scope of capacity of any other uh, um, uh, surface uh, storage facilities. With this, uh, geologists believe that uh, subsurface formation can provide us a giant volumetric capacity for storing hydrogen. And like it, any other uh, um, operation in the subsurface, there are several aspects we need to consider, from economic to social, all the way to technical and uh, geological uh, aspect. Here and today, I would like only focus on the hydrodynamic aspect of underground hydrogen storage, where defining uh, capillary pressure and relative permeability in a meaningful way is essential to have a successful reservoir simulation. If we look at the literature, of course, there are several studies, uh, what they have done uh, about uh, feasibility study of 
underground hydrogen storage. For example, in the first uh, paper I mentioned here, they used a query type equation to generate relevance, uh, um, capillar, uh, relative permeabilities for hydrogen brine in the porous media. But you know, they, they, used, uh, they did it in the monotonic way without considering that underground hydrogen storage is a cyclic operation. We need to inject and then produce, reclaim back the hydrogen from the uh, subsurface formations. So we need to define the um, relevant cyclic uh, transport property for that. In the second paper, uh, they did core flooding experiment to generate capillary pressure and relative permeability for, uh, um, for hydrogen and brine. They injected hydrogen into a saturated uh, core sample with the reservoir brine. And somehow, uh, inversely, they calculated contact angle from the capillary pressure curves. And uh, in the couple of slides, I will speak how we did the porous scale modeling. Uh, regarding the, the limitation of the literature study, I would like to emphasize that both of those uh, research I mentioned in the previous slide, both of them only consider the first cycle of displacement which uh, we call is primary drainage, where hydrogen is injected into a reservoir. However, when we want to use a query type equation to get a relative permeability for the hydrogen brine system, we need to define a um, proper exponent for the uh, um, to, uh, both two phases of hydrogen and brine. However, in that uh, study, they didn't um, distinguish between the wetting and non-wetting uh, phase here. And uh, as I mentioned, there is only one core flooding experiment for a specific reservoir condition. And uh, with the uh, capillary pressure curves, they uh, reported contact angle of, uh, um, of the con uh, hydrogen and brine in contact with brine, uh, in contact with the rock sample about 20 degrees, which correspond to the receding contact angle because they did only drainage cycle uh, where hydrogen is injected into a reservoir. But you know, because of the cyclicity uh, nature of this uh, hydrogen storage in underground, we need to define a proper uh, um, properties of the uh, hydrogen when, it, uh, when we want to produce it. So we need to uh, define a, um, we need to define the contact angle hysterity um, during the production because uh, we uh, we would have uh, advancing contact angle for the production cycle. And if we pick up the 20 degree receding contact angle from the from that uh, core flooding experiment and follow the Morris curve, uh, we will end up about uh, for the intrinsic contact angle about 80 degree correspond to the advancing contact angle higher than the 90 degree, which represent as the gas wet system. But you know, it does not make sense physically how hydrogen can change the wettability of the system. So maybe we need to modify the Morris relationship or we need to define any other relationship for the uh, hysteretic of the contact angle. With that, uh, for uh, in our uh, first paper on poor scale modeling, we did sensitivity analysis with uh, regards to different parameter to quantify the uncertainty in this system. Such as wettability, we defined the uh, range of uh, contact angle of advancing and receding, and to study the structure, the effect of a structure of the rock, uh, we either use uh, extracted network from the real rock samples of sandstone and carbonates, and uh, for a specific uh, study of the any other parameter of the rock structure, we use a, stati a statistical generated network for uh, measuring uh, effect of clay volume percentage and uh, average coordination number uh, represent the uh, connectivity of the system. What we found in our first paper is that in addition to the lack of data in the literature, uh, rock structure and wettability are two uh, effective parameters which can affect on the uh, capillary pressure and relative permeability curves. And uh, with knowing these uh, um, importance of the input parameter, uh, and of course in the absence of lab, uh, lab data, uh, we established hydrogen lab here at TU Delft. 
to measure the uh, con uh, directly contact angle of hydrogen brine sandstone system using captive bubble method. If you are curious to know how we can we could measure uh, directly contact angle, I have to explain this setup to you. There is a uh, high pressure and high temperature cell inside this oven, uh, which can provide us a, a, a desired temperature. And uh, with this cap, uh, back pressure, uh, we can have a desired pressure in the system. So uh, this is the cross section of uh, this cell. And uh, here is the schematic of that, or uh, it's, a, it's an image from the uh, inside the cell. And uh, as you see here, uh, there is a rock sample on the top of the cell. And uh, this cell is filled with uh, water using this pump and this uh, brine is coming to the cell and fill the cell with the water. And uh, using this gas cylinder and this pump through the gas line, we can inject uh, some bubbles from any gases to, uh, to the uh, cell. And uh, there is a camera in this cabin connected to this side of the cell and this computer. Then several images are taken from uh, the, uh, the bubble in different uh, time scale. And uh, with that, uh, for the range of uh, pressure from 20 to 100 bar in the horizontal axis in this uh, graph, you can see range of pressure. We, uh, we did uh, our experimental test. And uh, here in the vertical axis, you can see the contact angle results for different uh, temperature from 20 to 50 degrees. And for different salinities here, uh, you are seeing only for the uh, 5 kppm NaCl uh, on the Bentheimer sample. And uh, you know, at first we benchmark our setup with nitrogen, then we move on to hydrogen. And uh, we found that the contact angle of uh, the intrinsic contact angle of hydrogen, brine, and sandstone uh, was between uh, 20, uh, 25 to 45 degrees. However, we did not observe any major sensitivity towards the testing parameter of different pressure, temperature, salinity, and sandstone samples. And with that, I would like to give you some take home messages from uh, my presentation. First, uh, I, um, I want to again emphasize on the importance of uh, defining meaningful uh, capillary pressure and relative permeability to have a successful reservoir simulation since they are the input parameter for our simulations. So it is crucially important to have a reliable uh, um, upscale properties, uh, which themselves uh, um, depends on the poor scale physics then um, with that, uh, we did core flood, uh, we did um, contact angle measurement of, uh, of the static contact angle measurement for hydrogen, brine, and sandstone. And we found that it was completely different than uh, what uh, reported in the literature. They reported 20 degree of, re of the receding contact angle for the uh, hydrogen, brine, and uh, which correspond to 78 degree of intrinsic contact angle. However, our result, uh, our, the average of our results uh, uh, was uh, about 35 degree. They were completely different. And uh, we did not observe any sensitivity of, uh, with the range of pressure and temperature and salinity we did uh, our experiment with that. Uh, and uh, if you uh, want to know uh, more details about my presentation, uh, I would like to invite you, please visit our papers. And um, I would like to thank my teammates and co-authors uh, here in uh, Hydrogen Lab team. And thank all of you for uh, your attention. And I'd be happy to discuss if you have any comments or questions. Excellent presentation, Leila. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was <clears throat> very enlightening. Uh, it's especially interesting to see uh, someone doing uh, experiments and simulations. So I think you probably have a really good understanding of, of these phenomena. And I have a question that's slightly unrelated to the scales you presented here, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, I've seen people that are working on molecular dy dynamic simulations for uh, understanding better these processes. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, 
what what do you think what type of information would you think we can get from from those scales to inform uh, your simulations better yeah of course uh, molecular dynamic simulation uh, can be an alternative way to do a, um, a study at the pore scale or um, at the molecular scale i would say um, uh, with that we can uh, um, we can define proper uh, um, input parameter for the pore scale modeling like contact angle or even interfacial tension both of them can be calculated from uh, the molecular dynamic simulations uh, actually i would say there are some ongoing research here at u delft some of uh, my colleagues uh, have some plan to uh, continue the research on that topic yeah of course uh, it would improve the input parameter for uh, getting better understanding of uh, both two uh, phases of hydrogen and different brine excellent uh, thank you thank you for your answer we we have a question from the audience um it's from sayad and uh he he's asking uh about your your experimental results uh, it seems that there's not a lot of variability with respect to either uh, rock type or conditions, but um, uh, according to him, there's there's a paper by Iglauer that that shows uh, different changes uh, in different conditions. Do you know how how we can reconcile uh, both of the results? Yeah, thank you for this great uh, question and arising this uh, uh, comparison. Uh, uh, actually, yeah, I've seen that paper too, and uh, I, I can say uh, the, our work is a, a bit different. Our uh, um, our experimental approach is a bit different because we are doing a captive bubble cell, which um, we believe that it's very relevant to the real condition in the uh, subsurface the storage. Because in the reality of uh, in the real system, you have a rock surface in contact with the brine, then you are injecting or introducing hydrogen into your system. However, in, there is another approach uh, which call, uh, we call it uh, Cecil Drop. When uh, there is a, a, a surface, it can be rock or even any non-prose uh, uh, sample, then uh, you can have it uh, and uh, uh, fill the cell with the, uh, any gases you want to uh, do measurements, and then uh, you can inject uh, one droplet of uh, brine into the system, which is uh, vice versa uh, uh, in, in comparison with uh, what we are doing here. And uh, any uh, the other difference with uh, our uh, experiment and what uh, Iglars uh, team are doing is that uh, they are uh, using tilted uh, plates uh, method and then uh, they cannot measure the intrinsic contact angle they have a tilted surface and uh, they can measure the dynamic contact angle which is different than the intrinsic or static contact angle of the hydrogen yeah i think uh, this is the difference uh, what i can say about our uh, approach or their approach and uh, these differences can uh, affect on the results. Yeah, I hope it answers the question. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I don't think we have further questions from the audience at this moment, but um, feel free to 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 send them to uh, Lila's uh, email address in case you have further further concerns. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a, a great presentation. So um, I would like now to introduce our second speaker. He's uh, Dayo Akindipe. He is currently uh, a PhD student at the University of Wyoming. And his research interests are uh, around uh, CO2 sequestration and the geological processes that happen during, during this, um, this process. Um, he, in, in this presentation, he's going to talk to us about salt precipitation in, in, in real realistic media and heterogeneous media. And uh, he's going to describe uh, a new mechanism uh, that controls the solids accumulation in, in reservoirs. Um, without further ado, Dio, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this um, opportunity. 
um, to make this presentation today. Um, I'll be talking about salt precipitation in saline porous media um, from a poor scale perspective. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, um, Dr. Sohel Saraji, and my co-advisor, uh, Dr. Mohamed Piri, uh, for um, the opportunity to do this work on their collaborative efforts. Um, the outline of this presentation is going to start with an introduction. I will have a short research description. I will discuss some of our exciting results and uh, give my final remarks. As we all know, um, CO2 has been um, touted as a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, and we see that the atmospheric concentration is at record levels and keep, keeps rising. One way uh, through carbon capture, utilization, and storage um, is to, uh, you know, sequester CO2 geologically um, in certain aquifers and depleted oil and gas reservoirs. So um, one of the issues that have come up um, in pilot studies is um, near well bore salt precipitation, such that we have a salt accumulation, uh, which leads to um, loss of um, injectivity, uh, well injectivity as um, we inject CO2. Um, evaporative drying um, is, a is, a, is a main principle, you know, that um, describes um, precipitation from aqueous media is characterized by two, three main periods. Um, the constant rate period where we have uh, a fairly constant, as we see here uh, on, on the plot on the right, a fairly constant uh, constant rate period um, of a, a constant evaporation. And then we have a drop in, evapor in evaporation. And then we have a falling rate period where we begin to see a frontal advancement of, of, of solute into the medium and towards the outlet. And in terms of you know subsurface uh, saline media, which I'll be talking about today, uh, from a literature view by um, Miriam Halivang, um, they um, outlined three distinct zones. And zone one <coughs> is a dried out zone where you have um, lots of precipitates coming up. And then in between that zone and the unsaturated um, flow zone, we have um, um, salt and um, we also have some CO2 and brine in the mix. Um, so we essentially have multi-phase flow. And then um, we have the unsaturated zone, which contains 100% uh, brine. And um, these zones are separated by an evaporation front and a, and a flooding front. Um, to describe this um, research work that we did, we, we, we wanted to to answer a couple of questions, especially uh, relating to salt precipitation in naturally occurring uh, porous media. Uh, first, how does it occur uh, in this media? Um, what is the extent of change in pore morphology? What are the most likely precipitation sites? What's the effect of CO2 and injection rate? At? And how does heterogeneity affect the dynamics of precipitation? And so we carried out um, um, a series of um, core flooding, we call them here in the miniature core flooding experiments, uh, such that we, we, we um, inject um, fluids into a small core sample, could, could be as small as five millimeters in diameter um, and at high pressure and temperature um, using um, micro CT imaging and as well as FIPSIM imaging after you know, we, we get our results. Um, I, I did um, the experiments with two main materials, a Clashac sandstone sample and a Clarishell limestone sample. Um, the, Cla the Clashac sample is uh, majorly quartz uh, with uh, some feldspar and um, a little bit of some clay minerals. It's one of the cleaner sandstones out there. And then I did um, also the experiments with the Clarishell limestone mostly mostly as we can see mostly calcite um, with um, some intragranular and intergranular micropores and the brine the brine system was sodium iodide so any sodium iodide solution about 250,000 ppm salinity and the co2 was applied as liquid but we heated and pressurized it to critical state um, three coffin experiments were done um, at, um, so the two carbonates were done at two different rates and one sandstone experiment 
and the imaging was done at high resolution of about two uh, microns. And um, the core flooding sequence was we first um, we first vacuumed the, the core sample uh, and then introduced brine to uh, have 100% brine saturated medium. And then we injected CO2 um, as, a, as a primary drainage uh, injection um, at a certain rate um, to serve as a baseline for our uh, our dry out sequence. And sequentially we injected um, CO2 at different time intervals. So first, um, after injecting the first stage of CO2 for primary drainage, um, uh, as we know that the once CO2 um, invades the system, it mostly you know occupies um, the centers or of larger and medium-sized pores because of the wetting order. Um, we believe that water, as we can see in the images, um, water is more wetting than CO2. So CO2 would occupy the centers and move water to the corners, the sharp corners and the uh, crevices of these pores. Um, also, we noticed that uh, many of the larger pores were not also invaded by the CO2 at the 0.1 centimeter cube per minute injection rate. Um, this was uh, followed by a sequence of hourly um, injection. So um, <clears throat> within the first 12 hours of our dry out sequence, uh, we did not see any significant um, change in the uh, pore field occupancy. Um, mostly um, the CO2 kind of, the, 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 the system kind of reached the plateau. And, uh, but as we continue to the 24th hour, we see here that the uh, CO2 was able to invade some pores at the top of this 24 hour image. Um, and so um, it begins to give us a clue as to, okay, what is happening? And we thought we had gotten to a plateau. And then um, going on to, to the 24th hour, we even see a more um, significant um, uh, finding, I would say, um, we, we see that the, the brine has probably <laughs> disappeared um, or it has reduced uh, in intensity uh, to as uh, low as uh, the grain. And um, we were trying to scratch our heads and see oh, what is going on here. So we continued um, uh, even to, to the next hour. Um, the process, which I will describe as uh, reverse solute diffusion. Um, so let's see how this uh, goes. So first, we, we had this 48-hour image where the brine intensity was same as a rock, um, basically reduced. And so if you look at what we did, we only imaged the, the field of view. So we had a field of view at the center of the core sample, CO2 being injected from the top. And this is what we initially inferred, which I will actually confirm uh, later on. Um, First, we, as we know from the literature, salt starts to precipitate from the top, from the entry surface of the sample. And so um, we see that an evaporation front is actually um, moving from the top of the sample uh, to, towards the, the bottom. So as, as this is happening, solutes are being drawn towards this um, evaporation front from our field of view that we have here. So as these solutes have been drawn towards the front, um, we see a drop or a reduction in the concentration of the solutes um, below the front. So this, this creates uh, a concentration gradient, uh, which we uh, will see later on in our 60 hour image. But going back to the literature, um, in the literature, they describe this um, as more or less the brine itself being drawn by capillary action towards the evaporating front and not necessarily the solute. Um, so, but we, we observed solute, solute being drawn within the connected brine phase um, um, towards this, this front. And this gives us a really huge clue um, as, to, as to what is actually going on. So we, we are here at the 60th hour image and at the red line drawn here is, the, is where uh, we believe the front was. 
And above the front, we have mostly salt. And below, we have a concentration gradient of brine. As we can see here, the brine begins to reappear um, um, and forms a concentration gradient down the field of view. And this confirms what we inferred earlier, the 48 hour image, where the solutes are being drawn to a moving, um, evaporating uh, front. And at the seven, uh, seven second hour, we see that brine had fully precipitated within the field of view. Um, it's possible that even throughout the core sample, brine may not have um, precipitated, um, as we can see on the image, but within the field of view, uh, brine had fully precipitated. And so this is this is like uh, this is a general overview of the reverse solute diffusion process that we uh, figured out eventually. And so what, what is the uh, effect of injection rate on salt uh, precipitation? Um, we, we observed that uh, comparing the two carbonate samples, it affects the time to precipitation, um, basically, and it also affects the eventual salt saturation. So less time, less salt. And that, why, why is that happening? We, in, at, at the first stage that I mentioned, the advection dominated flow, um, CO2 is better able to displace brine. And of course, if you had less brine in the, in the system before precipitation occurs, you would have less absorbed uh, brain precipitated out. Uh, we try to um, compare the cluster size uh, distribution to um, related to the injection rate. Uh, but we found out that um, it did not, it, the cluster size distribution was invariant of injection rate. So um, mostly the, the salt precipitates that formed were medium sized clusters uh, within a range of uh, five times 10 to minus six to one times 10 to minus three millimeter cube. And uh, for, for both systems, there was no big difference in salt cluster size. So uh, we, we concluded here that the cluster size is invariant of whatever injection rate that we have. Uh, we observed precipitation in, in the micropores, both in the carbonate and the sandstone sample. Uh, for the sandstone sample, the, the uh, salt precipitated mostly in the clay bearing, uh, clay mineral, within the clay minerals, basically, as we can see on the image in the, with the red rings, um, a lot of salt precipitated out in these areas. And, uh, <clears throat> And for the carbonate, we see it salt precipitating um, within uh, intrafossil or intragranular micropores. And to zoom in uh, specifically for the carbonates, um, we see an intragranular uh, deposition of salts here uh, that's be between, between two carbonate uh, grains. And at the bottom image, um, this is an in intragranular um, deposition where we have um, salt depositing within uh, in fissure, fissures within um, a certain uh, carbonate grain. And uh, if we, do, if we um, account for the effect of micropores, we see a larger difference in uh, salt saturation in the sandstone compared to the carbonate. We believe that this uh, happened because um, the clay bearing the clay bearing uh, minerals tend to absorb more of this aqueous uh, solution better than, um, for example, just um, having some uh, micropores in the, in the, within the grains, for example. So we believe that this um, salt precipitate that precipitated out of the sandstone sample was actually much more um, intense in, in, in the micropores in the sandstone compared to the carbonate. Um, the overall effect of um, salt precipitation is porosity reduction. Comparing across uh, um, carbonates to sandstone, we see a more uniform uh, uh, porosity change in the sandstone um, relating to the fact that um, the sandstone sample on the whole are more um, homogeneous compared to, to the carbonate uh, system. And so finally, um, so to recap all I've said today, We've outlined three um, stages of evaporative drying in um, real reservoir systems. Uh, the first stage is an evaction dominated transport where you have CO2 displacing brine um, um, to, to the extent of the pressure drop within the system. And then 
we have a transition stage where I describe the reverse solid diffusion mechanism um, that helps to uh, insert solid accumulation at the moving evaporation front. And finally, solid accumulation at the front causes um, the diffusion controlled evaporation and eventual precipitation at the front. And uh, the final salt precipitation is limited by the medium precipitation in medium sized pores, such that uh, we have mostly medium sized clusters. And the uh, higher ejection, injection rate actually helps to reduce the effect. So in the field application, for example, if it's possible, it's better to go um, at a higher injection, well, as high as possible, because someone asks how high, really. <laughs> and then uh, the microporous media um, actually have significant contributions. So um, in terms of reservoir simulation, they need to be accounted for. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to um, say that if you have any further you know, um, interest in, in my work, um, it's published in the Advances in Water Resources Journal. And I'd like to acknowledge um, the sponsorship of Thermo Fisher Scientific, the Hess Corporation and the School of Energy Resources in the University of Wyoming uh, for this work. And I, I'm really grateful to the Interpro Academy and the Pearls Media, Media Team Time Talk team uh, for the opportunity to give this presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dale. It was a really interesting presentation. I've been doing uh, CO2-induced salt precipitation uh, studies, experiments, modeling for a couple of years, and it, it was a really great piece of work you've done here. Thank lots you very of much. Interesting results and lots of important implications. Uh, well done. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Kofi. Can this CO2 crystallization uh, be conducted above ground to generate valuable minerals for industry, for example, food, drug, construction? If so, what would need to be considered? Purity of CO2, cation species, and something like that. Yes, um, I, I think it's it's more or less um, talking about mineral mineralization of maybe um, carbonates. Um, yes, it's it's. I think from what I've read in the literature, is more of energy that is the problem. It's quite energy intensive, um, and um, for it can be done, of course, um, because it's this is also applicable in soil cyanization, for example, at the surface. Um, it's more or less your. Uh, basically injecting CO2 at the um, at the surface, maybe um, perpendicular to the surface, you know, to induce that precipitation, that drawing of of solutes from um, the porous media or whatever media that you, ha you have towards towards the the evaporating surface. Interesting. Yeah, we have another question uh, from Gulte. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent talk. Have you encountered any difficulty to segment solid salts and drawing phases <laughs> for the images below, yeah, that, belong to the transition stage? Yeah, that's a great question. I have a slide. Uh, let me show. I, I, yeah, here. So I, I, this is this was a major issue. <laughs> so uh, trying to figure out the difference between this brine. The brine one and brine two. How how do I? Uh, so I, I use the machine learning algorithm um, supplied to us by Thermo Fisher Scientific um, to actually um, detect. So I, I basically gave a range intensity range for for brine one. I had to and then brine two. So um, it was able to detect the two different brine phases as you see here. In, in the segmentation. So yeah, it's if conventional, uh, maybe um, thresh, um, interactive or uh, um, overlay thresholding, or um, even sometimes watershed segmentation may not really suffice for, for this. And this uh, machine learning technique, is it part of Aviso or Pergeos? Uh, uh, per, Pergeos, per yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, as, a, and as a final question, I have a question of my own. This uh, reverse solute diffusion, how, how can it be uh, mixed with the self-enhancing uh, characteristics exactly. of uh, yeah, salt that... precipitation? And then how we should update clogging models for the salts? Yes, um, I, I believe um, 
uh, Miriam Hellevang talked about the self-enhancement, which actually gave us a clue as to what was happening, um, <laughs> thanks to them. Um, they, they inferred uh, something called surface tension, a surface tension force that enhances it. And actually that is true. In the literature, it's um, emphasized that uh, at the front, we have a higher surface tension at the front, um, that's the surface tension between um, the CO2 and the brine. So that higher surface tension at the front relative to you know, below the front helps in that solute drawing the solute to itself as a, as a driving force for solute um, uh, diffusion toward, because actually, of course, we should not have um, movement of solute from a lower to higher, it should be higher to lower normal diffusion. And that's why we called it uh, reverse solute diffusion. So that, you know, tension um, at the surface, at the evaporating front actually draws solutes towards it. So uh, in terms of modeling, I believe you should um, 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 impose um, that um, higher surface tension uh, at the front. Uh, I, it's, it's probably going to be a bit complex because the front is moving. You have to update the, 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 the it, it has to update itself, you know, as the front is moving, the surface tension. So yeah, but it's possible. And the last question from Julio, great presentation for long time CO2 injection, considering salt precipitation, uh, what do you suggest as prevention technique to solve such issue? Yeah, so in the in the field, I have yeah in the field here, um, in the Snovit field, they actually injected a mixture of methyl ethyl glycol and water. So normally you would think that oh, I just need to inject maybe very um, probably deionized or distilled water or something, which of course is quite expensive. So they had to you know mix. Um, Methyl ethyl glycol, which I, I believe is 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 a better solvent even than water um, for for these salts. Perfect. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much, Dayo, for the presentation and for the yeah. discussion. Oh, it's great uh, to be here. Thank you so uh, much for this opportunity. It's our pleasure. And now we can wrap up this session. We went a bit of uh, more than expected uh, for our uh, talks. We usually try to finish it under. 40 minutes, but we are a bit more than that today. Uh, now it's now time to announce the speakers for the next session. In two weeks, uh, we will host Song Li and Mahdi Mansouri with two diverse talks on poor scale origins of flow induced bioaggregation and also poor invasion dynamics in transition from viscous to capillary flow regimes during drainage in porous media. With that, uh, I would like to thank you for joining us today and please feel free to give us feedback and try to uh, help us uh, make this platform better for PhDs and early career researchers. With that, I would like to thank you and have a nice day. Ciao.